here epsilon 1, 2, and here the, the linear strain. And what it, this one is telling me that if I have here epsilon 1, 1, and this is epsilon 2, 2, the shear strain at 45 degrees is going to be of the same magnitude that the magnitude of epsilon 1, 1 and epsilon 2, 2. You see that? So the radius of this is just either epsilon 1, 1 or negative of that. It's just the radius of that circle. And, and last, uh, we, we can write uh, here that uh, I could define uh, well I, I don't I don't really have to define it I just can say that epsilon 1 2 is equal to uh, 1 minus Poisson ratio e times uh, times uh, Sigma, right? Uh, I, I, I'm missing something, and probably you have the answer. What, what do you want to say? Wait, wait, wait a minute. Yes, there, there, there are two things I'm missing here. You're right. It should be the one, and then when you add it, it should be plus. And second thing, anyone found another mistake? This one should be true, right? And so this is going to look uh, like that. And uh, I'm, I'm basically, I'm going to define now this is going to be, uh, let me see. So if this is sigma, and this is, this is the sh this is equivalent to to a shear stress sigma one two epsilon one two no 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 okay th this equation is correct uh, but I have to add this one over here so uh, let me move this one so I have a space to finish it up here it's just one more step. If I multiply two times this, two epsilon one two, and here two one plus Poisson ratio divided by e and sigma, we know this is sigma one two. I'm going to get that value over here. You see, two epsilon one two, sigma one two, the proportionality coefficient of the of this is that 2 plus 1 plus Poisson ratio divided by E. Yes? So then would it be accurate to say that 1 plus V over E is G? Two no. So this thing is defined as G. All, all that thing. So, and this is the same divided by E. 1 plus, so that's, that's not a V, remember, that's a Greek letter, nu, okay? And that's what we call G, but that's one over G, right? that's one over G very well. That's 1 over G. Uh, so, but, but it, it's, it's not an independent coefficient. It's, it's just a result of the other ones. Yes? Correct, correct, and, and that's where we're going right now. So, so now, for isotropic elasticity, we know all the coefficients of the, what is called the compliance matrix. And I'm going to write down what, what you just said. So this matrix, epsilon, is going to be equal to D times 
uh, sigma, and this one is called a compliance matrix. If I wanted to get from here what is sigma as a function of strain, I will have to multiply the inverse of D to the left or to the right and times this one. So this one will get identity. So here to the left, I will have D inverse. That is what we call the stiffness matrix. But notice that our either compliance or stiffness matrix now is fully defined based on the experiments that we have done. Actually, with just one experiment like this, you can measure Young modules and you can measure Poisson ratio. With this other experiment, we just uh, show that uh, the shear modulus is actually a combination of the Poisson ratio and the Young modulus. But those are just two coefficients. So uh, in, in order to complete the picture here, what you could do is, is, is you could say, OK, if I know the compliance matrix and I take the inverse of that matrix, I should be able to now actually calculate the stiffness matrix, which is the first thing that we define. And you can do that. Uh, you guys want to calculate the inverse of that matrix uh, on paper? No? I, I don't, I don't want to do that either. So instead of that, if you, if you don't believe me, you can go and, and do this with, uh, with Python, the symbolical um, solver, or with uh, Mathematica, or some other tool. Or I, actually, you can go, and I used to use that a lot. You can use Wolfram Alpha. It has a symbolical solver too that is going to give you the solution of this. But basically, the solution of that is going to be like this. We're going to have a constant here. And over here, we're just going to have 1 minus Poisson ratio, Poisson ratio, Poisson ratio. Poisson ratio, 1 minus Poisson ratio, zeros. And over here, 1 minus 2 Poisson ratio divided by 2. 1 minus 2 Poisson ratio divided by 2 times epsilon 1, 1, epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 3, 3, 2, epsilon 2, 3, 2, epsilon 1, 3, 2, epsilon 1, 2. And now this is what we call the stiffness matrix for an isotropic solid. I, I didn't put too much attention on the, so, so you see it takes quite a bit of work to, to array to derive the the stiffness matrix for an isotropic solid. If you were to assume a transverse isotropic solid, a ver vertical transverse isotropic, that would take a lot of work. And uh, if I know that many of you that are working in rocks uh, may be interested on in that. So if you want more information about that, I recommend two things. One, you, you talk to me and I can give you additional literature about VTI uh, systems and the other one is you could take the class from Professor Spikes in geology and he, he goes through through a lot of the uh, problems related to, to VTI media but for now we're gonna limit it to this and um, again if, if you have more more questions about that uh, just, just let me know and I'll I direct you in the in the right in the right direction. Uh, okay, so what do we do with this now? Uh, it, it looks that, that we have solved all our problems, right? Uh, well, th th this is the beginning 
of solving a general elasticity problem. And uh, we have already solved that problem, right? But now I'd like that you solve another problem, uh, which is a, a problem uh, which is very common in the, in the subsurface. And that's the problem of what is called uh, one-dimensional strain. Let's see how we're doing with time. I, th I think we're good, but I, I want to talk about PNS waves. Yeah, I think we have time, too. Uh, so, using that same matrix, and uh, I don't remember if that one is the one. Yeah, that one is easier to, to solve this problem. Using that, this same matrix, I like that you solve a problem for which you have a solid that to which you apply. Let's imagine now, now we're going to prescribe. That, that's the right word. We're going to prescribe a given deformation on direction 3, but we know expansion in directions 1 and 2. OK? So 1, 2, 3, you can imagine what the direction 2 is going to look like. But I'm telling you that there is not going to be, let me make this a little bit bigger. There is not going to be the same as there is no expansion in direction 1, there is no expansion in direction 2. There is just a strain in direction 3. So I like that you tell me two things. The first one is I like to know what is the proportionality coefficient between sigma 3, 3 and, well, I can write it. It's going to be called m and epsilon 3, 3. But I like that you tell me what is m in terms of Poisson ratio and Yamojus. And the second thing that I, I want you to tell me is what is going to be the value of sigma 1, 1 and sigma 2, 2 as a function of sigma 3, 3. You can imagine that if I were to prescribe a displacement and therefore strain in this direction, the soil is going to try to expand in direction perpendicular to it. But because it can't, it's going to develop a stress in direction perpendicular to it. So using this matrix, you're going to be able to solve the problem. OK? I'll give you five minutes to, to solve that. And let me know if you have a question, OK, or, or, or any or any doubt, and this, this is not an exam, this is just a problem solution in class, just let me know.
Anyone has a solution already? Yes. So can anyone tell me what M is going to look like? So that's the value of M. Or also called, this is called longitudinal modulus, longitudinal modulus, also called constraint modulus, and also called odometric modulus. Different names for the same thing. And what about this? Proportionality coefficient. Check your equation, but you should get something like this. And and this coefficient is called and it's a very important equation you should remember. This is called the lateral stress coefficient. Usually goes by the letter K, okay? But in our in our literature, sometimes sometimes goes in order to avoid confusion by K capital. But sometimes you know we may think that that's permeability, so we're not going to use it that much. But usually goes by that by K. Oh, and also there is confusion with the bulk modulus, okay? But, but uh, be, be careful about this K. Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do here like a fancy K in order to make... Uh, I forgot how to, to write this with cur cursive, uh, something like this, okay? So, so that K is going to be... Um, the lateral stress coefficient. So, but j just forget about the K, okay? It's the lateral stress coefficient. So, here already we have a hint about, but we're not quite done yet, about how to calculate stress. Because if you know what is the, so here you say it says slowness, this is the reciprocal of velocity. If you know P wave velocity, and if you know shear wave velocity, you can find M and G. And, and if you have M and G, you can calculate here what is Poisson ratio and also what is Ian modulus. But just with two coefficients, or with two measurements, and also with density, you need density too in this case, you can calculate those two. So we can already calculate here stress. There, there is one, one step further, though, that we're going to have to use. And probably I'll talk about that if we don't have time today on Thursday. But you can already go, and I recommend that you do that. Download the file, which is uploaded in Canvas. That one, Lost Hills. Uh, it's an Excel file. And there you will find as a functional depth, and, and assume that it's a perfectly vertical well board, you'll find density, you will find P wave velocity, shear wave velocity. So with those 
uh, you're going to be able already to calculate uh, Poisson ratio and Young modules. Um, I have the equations of that somewhere else, but uh, you just can Google that and you will find them. Poisson ratio as a function of BP and BS, th those are very, very well-known equations, okay? Uh, and also they are in, in Sovax book, so you can find it there too. Uh, all right, so so let, let's let's continue. And uh, well, actually, you know, if you didn't get the answer, uh, everything you had to do here was to replace this one with zero, replace that one with zero as well. This one zero zero zero, and just multiply. And as soon as you multiply this one times that one, you get m. And since you get an expression of sigma 3, 3 as, as a function of epsilon 3, 3, later when you do sigma 1, 1 as a function of epsilon 3, 3, you can replace this epsilon 3, 3 for the function of sigma 3, 3, and some things are going to cancel out, and you're going to end up with this. It's very important, though, that you remember that these type of equations require that you use the effective stress not the total stress. If you use the total stress, it's going to be wrong. You have to use total, you have to use effective stress, okay? So you can correct it by pore pressure. There is some old literature in which sometimes you find this equation of lateral stress in terms of total stresses with this coefficient, but that's wrong, okay? It should be effective stress. If you want to calculate the total stress, you add to the effective stress, the pore pressure, and you get the total stress. So for example, if say, for this example, I, w I wanted to know what is S11, I just would do sigma11 plus the pore pressure, OK? And the same with S22. Um, all right, so let, let's see why this type of condition is actually realistic. This is a much more realistic condition for many problems than the typical condition that you, we use in the laboratory, laboratory to measure, uh, where, where is that? To measure Young modules and Poisson ratio. So, I think this one is over here. So that one, that, that doesn't happen in the subsurface, okay? This is what usually happens in the subsurface. And let's see, let's see why. Let's see an example. I'm, I'm going to make two examples over here. One, it's an example of sedimentation. Let's say that you are here in, in Houston, and you have rivers going into the Gulf of Mexico and dropping sediments all the time. You guys have gone to Galveston, right? You know, it looks, looks very, uh, <laughs> you, you, you could say terrible. I, I, will, I would say loaded with sediments, okay? <laughs> with with fine-grained sediments uh, that make it look brownish, right? <laughs> but uh, those, those are sediments because you have you have a lot of rivers contributing to erosion and transporting silt, clay, and sand that are finally deposited in here. And as you drop off more and more sediments, you could imagine that a piece of sediment that was somewhere over here at time equal to zero years after 1,000 years, probably is going to, because you have more sediments going on top, it's going to deform, but it's going to deform mostly in one direction, in the absence of, or absence of any tectonic strains. Because it's not moving in, in, in direction perpendicular to this, because you have lots of sediments, and everything is just pushing in this direction, but but if this is not expanding, if this is not contracting, there is no reason to think that this one will expand to the sides. 
also is not going to expand to the sides because if it tries to expand to the sides, right next to it is going to have other pieces of sediment that are also trying to expand to the side. So if no one can expand to the side, uh, of, of the, they're all are trying to expand to the sides, but the other ones are not letting each other to expand to the side, then nobody's going to expand to the side, right? So, um, so this, this, this is what, what is going to happen in this case. This remind, reminds me of a friend of mine that, that used to tell that he was in a party that there were so many people that once he, he raised his arm, he couldn't lower them down. <laughs> so it's kind of like this, right? It's a condition in which you, you, you cannot move to the sides because there are just guys around you that also want to move to the sides. So no, no, no one is, is letting anyone else span to the sides. So it just deforms in one direction. So this will be T, say, after a thousand years. But there is another condition for this too. Uh, imagine that, that this, this was a, a reservoir that at some point over time uh, formed a layer to which uh, you are interested in it and you want to uh, take some hydrocarbons out of it. So you drill a well bore, you complete your well bore on the subsurface, and then what do you do in order to produce uh, those hydrocarbons? So you're going to produce, if you want a flow rate that goes in this direction, you have to drop the pressure, right? You have to drop the pressure here at the well bore uh, so to cause fluid in this direction, uh, fluid movement. If you drop the pressure, what is going to happen to, let's say that on top of this, there is a, a shale layer, which is carrying an overburden SV. Remember, we already did, did this. I think we did. If you drop the pressure as a function of time, this is time. This is the pore pressure in, inside here. Uh, let, let me draw that again. Uh, actually, I'm going to use the entire, entire sediment layer. So it's. You think the overburden is going to change? If you develop a pore pressure, no, right? The overburden is going to stay the same, especially if the cap rock is very compliant. If it deforms, it's going to stay the same. What is going to increase with time? The effective vertical stress. And we're going to see later on that also the horizontal stress is going to increase with time. But as a result of this, also you're going to have reservoir compaction. So the reservoir is going to deform just in one direction. It's the same story as that one over there. As you increase effective stress, this one may be tempted, uh, since you have more stress, you may be tempted to expand to the sides, but it can't because you have all the other elements and sections of the rock that are also trying to expand to the side, and if nobody can expand to the side, then you're just going to have a change of stress, of lateral stress, uh, and you're going to have de deformation in just one direction. And this condition is called uh, uniaxial deformation, or also odometric deformation. Do not confuse this one, uniaxial deformation with uniaxial stress. Some people tend to call uniaxial stress to this uh, unconfined condition example. 
because you have stress in one direction. In the other ones, there is no stress. So that one, some people call it uniaxial stress. Uh, I prefer to call it uh, unconfined if there is no stress. And, but this one is going to be uniaxial deformation. There is one more explanation for this, and this is how we uh, close here the topic on the constraint modules and P wave velocity. And for that, I'd like first to, to show a video. Uh, so let me go in here. Towards the end of the course, we're going to talk about uh, elastic wave propagation. And let's see, let me try. But now I, I would just like to, to show this very nice animation that I have to acknowledge when, when, I, when I presented my, I, I did a thesis for undergrad and I didn't acknowledge the source. At that time I didn't know, you know, about acknowledging sources when you show somebody else's work. But now I acknowledge the source, okay? It's a work from Purdue. This is a P wave. Look at that element. Look how it deforms when the wave passes. You see, it just deforms in direction x in this case. It's, it does not deform in direction z, states the same size, and it does not deform in direction y. So look, look at the, the length of those squares in direction y. It's always the same. There is deformation just in one direction. And that's, that's a P wave. So, as a result, the P wave uh, is just going to be what do you think? Now if I write it as P wave instead of constraints uh, of the modulus, the square root of M divided by rho. That's it. The proportionality coefficient is m, the same m that you just calculated on your own. And similar to that, um, let me just draw this. So remember, this is a p wave that travels in this direction, and if this is a grid, uh, 